is noon, we can go ahead and get started. All right, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our virtual Rebel Recharge Lecture. It has been exciting to watch this program grow, thrive, and educate our alumni and friends in the virtual environment, and we are thrilled so many of you have chosen to be with us today. My name is Stacey Purcell, and I'm the president of the UNLV Alumni Association. And it is my pleasure to welcome each of you here today. And personally, just to give a special welcome to all of you. I'd also like to acknowledge Blake Douglas, our interim associate vice president for alumni engagement and interim associate director of the UNLV Alumni Association. A special thank you to Renee Rivera Gelfi, coordinator for programs and events for producing today's virtual lecture. Our next virtual Rebel Recharge is scheduled for Friday, April 16th, and the topic is the servant heart and philosophy, an introspective review of servant leadership, presented by three-time UNLV alumna and director of advising and recruitment in the UNLV Honors College, Dr. Tony Terrell, 02, 07, and 12. We have a robust schedule of events, both new and familiar this spring, and I encourage you to visit our website engage.unlv slash events for more information on all of our upcoming events. I also encourage you to share your excitement about the events you attend by inviting others to join you by posting on your social media channels and tagging at UNLV alumni. Our goal is to continue to grow our programs and events and create fun, educational and engaging opportunities for our alumni, faculty, staff, students and community members. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today's program, Dr. Chris Heavey. Dr. Heavey is the Executive Vice President and Provost at UNLV. In his role, he serves as the university's Chief Academic Officer and works closely with the President of UNLV in overseeing academic and budgetary policies and priorities for the campus. As a professor of psychology and a licensed psychologist, he conducts research to improve understanding of the inner experience and its relationship to mental health. He is one of the nation's leading scholars in the thoughts and feelings that make up the consciousness of people as they go about their everyday lives. Dr. Heaney has been with UNLV for more than 28 years. Wow, that is amazing. During which time he's been recognized for his award-winning work. He's also held several leadership and administrative positions over his career, including Senior Vice Provost, Dean, Vice Provost for Undergraduate Education, Director of General Education, Associate Dean, and President of the Nevada State Psychology Board. Starting tomorrow, a fact about Dr. Heavey and every weekend after that, you might see him mountain biking for over 20 miles and the trails of Henderson. We are thrilled to have you with us, Dr. Heavey, to share your research and perspectives of your inner life, how to learn about, about it and why it matters. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Chris Heavey. Well, thank you so much for that very gracious introduction. Uh, I'm humbled by it and, and thanks also to Blake and Renee for uh, inviting me to this event. Um, just a little piece of trivia here. This event was initially scheduled for March 20th, 2020. And so we are one pandemic year later. So this was one of the first things that was canceled on my schedule. Uh, we would have been live in the TAM Alumni Center, but very happy to finally get back with you and be able to spend a, a little bit of time this afternoon talking about one of my other great interests and loves in life, other than trying to support UNLV and make sure that this place uh, uh, runs well is the research that I've been engaged in for the past 20 or so years about inner experience. And uh, I'll, I'll say at the outset, it's sort of, I think, might be a little bit of a surprising story to people. Um, it might be a little confusing and some possibility, maybe even a little bit upsetting of some of the things that I'm going to say, because I'm sort of a, a outsider in the field of psychology and the things that I'm going to say are out of the mainstream of what um, psychology thinks about. And, in a lot of ways, I think psychology really needs a revolution in how it thinks about inner experience. And the work that I'm going to talk about today that is done in collaboration with uh, my colleague Russ Hurlburt and good friend uh, who started this work maybe 40 years ago, 
um, I think lays the foundation for a much more informed psychology of inner experience. And we've also worked with many great graduate students over the years uh, who have helped us uh, with the research that's going to kind of inform this story that I'm going to tell you today. And lastly, you know, in terms of introductory remarks, happy to um, make this a very informal conversation. Uh, you might have questions and you might find things that I'm saying confusing or need some clarification or have other thoughts that you want to share. So feel free to raise your hand. I can't see all of you, I'm sorry to say, but uh, I think Renee can. And um, you can also uh, enter things into the Q&A that uh, Renee will help me with and I'll try to monitor a little bit as we go. And I'm also going to ask you just some questions to reflect on some things about yourself and maybe a little bit about your inner experience as we go. And so if you have a pencil and a paper, it might help to be able to jot down um, some thoughts and you can also uh, enter uh, comments in the chat. Now you'll see when I kind of have a few questions that I'll ask along the way. But I, I want to start really at the beginning of the story of psychology. Uh, and so really go back maybe 120 years or a little bit longer. If you think about the word psychology, it just basically means the study of the psyche. And when psychology originated, it was really in the early days of the advent of science as a, as a field um, and that the scientific principles were just beginning to be understood about what it means to do careful study of something. And the first questions that are, were of interest to many psychologists were, what is people's inner life like? What is it like to be you or to be me at any given moment? And so these questions have been uh, at the forefront and really the center of psychology since its inception. But for reasons that I'm going to explain during this talk, I think we've made far less progress on understanding the answers to those questions than most people might think. And so, for example, um, if you were to pick up an intro psych textbook, and if you haven't taken intro psychology, uh, I really encourage you to do it someday. It's a fascinating class. It's uh, tons of interesting information that we've learned about human beings. And often, and most of the time, you'd find a chapter in an intro psych textbook that would be called consciousness. And if you go to that textbook, and if you have a your old intro psych textbook, you can confirm this for yourself, and you look at what's in that consciousness chapter, what you'll be surprised at, you probably didn't notice it when you took intro psych and probably no one underlined it, is it probably said almost nothing about what normal everyday inner experience is like for people. What it talks about instead usually is selective intention, how we narrow our focus on the things, and that's a really important part of human psychology, and it influences inner experience in important ways. And then they talk about altered states of consciousness, usually like drugs, what's happening when people use uh, mind-altering substances, sleep, um, things like that. But they don't really talk about normal, everyday inner consciousness. And the reason for that is, is because psychology knows very little about normal, everyday inner consciousness. And so I'll, I'll talk about that more as we go and hopefully that'll become clear why I think that's the case. <clears throat> so we can talk about science as uh, essentially a systematic enterprise to organize knowledge through careful observation. That probably sounds like a reasonable definition to all of us, right? So we're going to organize knowledge through careful observation. And so what does that mean when we talk about applying that kind of methodology or that mindset or those set of techniques to inner experience. So we're going to try to build and organize knowledge about inner experience, but it turns out that that's a pretty difficult thing to do for reasons that I want to tell you about. So the first one is that it's personal, right? You are the only person who's able to observe your inner experience. And so one of the things that we um, take for granted is that we, for example, build a language to describe things in our world through a set of experiences that we have even before we're really uh, aware of them. And so, for example, uh, I could ask you, like, what color is my jacket? And you could think about, okay, if you can see it, it's a blue jacket uh, and I'm sitting in a black chair. And so you could think about, and these are the kinds of things that almost none of us um, uh, really um, have thought about, is how do we come to understand that this is blue and that's black and this shirt is actually red? It might look pink to you, but it's actually a, my Rebel Red Friday shirt. 
Um, and the way that we did that is as we were growing up, someone showed us those colors and then put names to them and said, this is something that's red and this is something that's blue and this is something that's black. And we remembered that and we realized of, over time through a bunch of different experiences that they weren't talking about the shape or they weren't talking about the fabric or the thing. It's not that it's a black chair. Black is separate from that it's a chair. We learned that black meant the color of it and that we could apply black to different kinds of surfaces. And then all of that sort of happened before we were even paying attention to how we came to understand the processes that uh, helped us understand or attach the meaning of words to specific things. But because inner experience is personal and only observed and experienced by you as an individual, that same kind of process of shaping the language of how we think about our own internal experiences never happened because no one's ever seen what it is like to be you and no one has ever experienced the experiences that you have as an individual. And so we've had to learn those language words or how to apply those words in a much more indirect way than we do with things that we can observe in the outside world. So we could all look at a chair and a table and we could decide that's a chair and that's a table. But we can't do that with your inner experience or my inner experience. We don't get to look at that the same. And so the process of careful observation and learning how to talk about those things is much more challenging. It's also challenging because inner experience is fleeting. It goes by quickly. And so when we talk about inner experience, it flies by us very quickly. You might call it ephemeral here now, gone the next second. So you can think about the example of um, how often we have the experience of saying, I was just about to say something, but now I can't remember what it was, right? And when you have that experience, you realize there was a thought, there was something that was present to you, but just a moment later, that thought's gone and is gone for good, right? You can't think of it again, or maybe sometimes it comes back to you, but it's slipped out of your consciousness in a way that you can't grab. And so we're talking about something that's difficult to uh, describe and something that's fleeting, and it may also be very complex. And it, um, it might be simple at particular moments, but it might also be complex. And so, for example, if you're sitting near a window or something, and I say, look out the window and think about what you see, you probably see a lot of different things, and it would, might take you quite a while to describe all of the things you see. Um, and because of that complexity, there's also a real load on the memory. So, for example, if I said, look out the window and, and get a good glimpse at that, and then close your eyes, how much of that could you recreate and describe back to us? So there's also limitations on our memory of how much of this fleeting, complex, ephemeral experience we can grab. So we have to figure out a method. If we really want to understand people's inner experience, we have to figure out a method. How do we try to overcome those inherent challenges of it? And the way that most of it's done in psychology essentially is two ways. One is to ask people to kind of give general characterizations of their inner experience. So I could, for example, ask you, what's your inner experience generally like? And you would probably give me an answer to that question. But from a scientific point of view, we have good reason to think that that answer is probably not actually very accurate because it's too broad a question. It's too many things to remember. They go by too quickly. It's so, for example, if I asked you, tell me about everything that you saw on your drive to work today, you would know that you couldn't answer that question, right? You'd think, no way can I remember everything I saw. So we shouldn't expect people to be able to remember all of the inner experience that flies by in their consciousness as they move about through the day. So we need to pick a particular moment of inner experience to try to focus on so that people can zero in on exactly what is this moment and keep that moment short so that it doesn't overwhelm their memory. Now, another way that people often try to understand their inner experience, and this is happened throughout the history of psychology is what we might call armchair introspection. And so you might say, okay, I'm gonna set out to really become an observer of my inner experience. And so every once in a while, I'm gonna stop myself and think, what am I thinking now? Or what am I experiencing right now? Okay, and so go ahead and try that. What are you experiencing right now? And just try to capture that. 
So one of the first challenges of that is that if you do that yourself, you are generating the cue to try to pay attention to your inner experience. And that cue, as you reflect on what's going on in your consciousness, you probably try to dismiss that cue. But probably, actually, mostly what you're thinking about is, what am I thinking about, right? What is my inner experience at that moment? And that probably washes out most of what is actually present in your experience. And so my colleague, as I said, about 40 years ago, was really interested in these questions. And he developed a method that's called descriptive experience sampling. And descriptive experience sampling starts with the notion of let's give people an external cue to pay attention to a precisely identified moment of their inner experience and ask them to capture what was present right then and then write some notes about it so that they'll forget it over time and then have a conversation with those people to try to carefully shape and understand the meaning of the words that um, that are being used to describe that experience. And so in a minute, I'm going to give you, so we'll come back to the question uh, um, uh, in a minute uh, that's in the thing here, because I think that's a good question. Um, but in a minute, I'm going to give you a cue to try to um, capture a moment of your inexperience. And so you're going to hear a beep, and the beep's going to be loud and clear. And when the beep happens, what I want you to do is to try to capture what was going on in your inner experience right before the beep sounded and jot down some notes about that. And then we'll ask a few people to put some comments about what they were able to capture in the chat and see if we can see how well you can do it, okay? So this method essentially is called uh, descriptive experience sampling. And it relies on, again, this notion of an external cue so you don't have to be the one thinking about where, when am I gonna actually try to pay attention to my experience. It's a clear cue so that it pinpoints you to a precise moment of experience. And then you have some memory aid so that you can say, okay, let's try to keep track of that uh, particular moment of inner experience. And so then I want to tell you a little bit about what we find when we use this method, because my colleague Russ has been doing this for about 40 years, and I've been doing this for about 20 years, where we give people this beeper and we ask them to pinpoint particular moments of their inner experience, and then we interview them to try to get clear descriptions of what those moments are. So that was the cue. See if you can capture what was present right when that happened. So the first time you do this, it's often very difficult. And people find, wow, that happened so fast, it surprised me and stuff. And so one of the things we learn about this method is you have to do it repeatedly. You have to actually kind of practice this. And what we call that is iterative training. Because the first time you do it, it's often sort of challenging. So, uh, so Stacy, since I can see your face, you want to share your, could, were you able to capture what was in your inner experience at that moment? Yes, Russ, 40 years, and Chris, over 20 years. It stuck in my head when, when the beep went on. Okay, good. That's perfect. So that is an idea. So then the question, the next question that can often be more challenging is, how was that present to you? So was that idea as a picture, or was it in words written down? Was it, um, or was it just an idea that was there without any particular, like, writing or symbols or anything like that. I don't know if that makes sense. Yes, it does. I, I just respect the fact that Russ has over 20, 40 years and you have over 20 years. And so it was a respect thing. Like, wow, I, I respect that. That's, that's a commitment. And it was a feeling, I think like, wow, that's incredible. Great. And that's a perfect example. And so. It sounds like when we started that, that maybe that uh, Stacy had an idea that was present to her. But upon more careful examination, it might have actually been a feeling as something that was sort of uh, more ephemeral or emotional in tone. 
And so what we find is that over time, if people practice this method, they can get pretty good about trying to capture what was present and then working with someone else they can get to the point where we can have become have a shared understanding of what those words mean so that we can actually start to develop what we call high fidelity descriptions of these moments of people's inner experience because people doing it themselves generally can't do that very well it's it's challenging um and um uh, because we have maybe preconceptions about what words mean or we it's hard to kind of like interview ourselves to get down to the really detailed um, descriptions of what those experiences mean. Um, so let me pause there for a second. And we'll go to the uh, go to the question here. So if I remember my history of psychology correctly, the very earliest part of psychology we relied upon interest. In the, Yes, that's correct. Thus, relying on inner experience. Is there anything in body research that's worth looking at today? Nothing other than the ideas about how to understand inner experience. Yes, and so it's interesting. So um, that's totally correct that the very earliest approaches were focused on inner experience. And in the history of psychology, that I think is generally characterized as a failed attempt to understand inner experience. And so there ended up being a big debate between Wundt and Titchener about the nature of what they were finding. And because they couldn't resolve that debate in any way, they uh, ended up essentially saying introspection doesn't work. And what ended up coming out of that, you might remember, is essentially behaviorism became the dominant form of psychological investigation. And uh, Skinner is essentially credited with this notion of saying, you know what, what's happening in people's minds is interesting, but we really can't study it effectively, and therefore we should just rule it out as a matter of interest in psychology. The problem is, is that what's happening in people's minds is very interesting to people, and that's what people want to know about, right? And so, you know, if you think about all of the times where we have major events that happen uh, during the during our lives, what do people ask you? They say, how did you feel when your husband proposed to you? Or what did you think when you saw that, you know, terrible accident that, you know, happened on the freeway or heard the news about the January 6th, you know, insurrection and invasion into the Capitol building? And people are, are interested in those things. That is such a fundamental part of our life the thoughts and feelings that populate our experience to sim simply rule them out is probably, you know, to make psychology very sterile. And so we believe that um, with this method, which is an improvement on what uh, Titchener and Wundt did from the point of view of um, trying to more comprehensively address the challenges that exist in understanding inner experience, we can get a pretty good view of what people's inner experience is. The problem is psychology just hasn't done much of this. They have generally asked people uh, to characterize their inner experience over broad stretches of time, and those characterizations are not very reliable. And so I don't think it's probably the case that anyone listening to this talk has ever gotten a beeper, and this is actually, I'll show you what they look like. These, we designed our own beepers here. It's funny too. It's actually hard. I'll, I'll play a beep, but you can't hear it because um, the system is very good at filtering out the noise. It's beeping right now to me, but you probably can't hear that. It considers it background noise. Um, but we basically uh, built these beepers that we engineered before. You can see the a few years ago. They're not as slick as things are now, and built a little chip so that this thing, when it's turned on, will go off randomly once every hour. And then when it goes off, the person jots down notes what was happening in their experience right before the beep sounded. And then once they get about six of those moments, we interview them to ask them what was in their experience right when the beep sounded. And then we use that essentially to build characterizations of people's inner experience from the ground up. And then use that essentially to start to get some foundational knowledge about what people's inner experience is really like. So, the first thing we find is that you know, the most common kind of denominators of inner experience are the form in which it occurs to you, not the topics, but the form. And the 
first few forms of inner experience that we find commonly, we, we have five that we've considered the five frequent phenomena. The first three of them you're not going to find surprising. So, for example, the first one is speaking to yourself. We call it inner speaking. And so most people have the experience of speaking to themselves where it's an internal mental voice that sounds just like they would say it out loud, but they're not actually saying anything, right? And in fact, some people who are armchair introspectionists think that people speak to themselves all the time, that that's a, you have a constant running inner monologue in your daily experience. I'm sure that's not true because we find some people who actually almost never speak to themselves. But it is a common form of inner experience. Inner experience excuse me. Another one is seeing mental images. And people probably can relate to this one too. And so for example, you can ask yourself the question, if picture the mental image of your front door, and if you picture that mental image, is the door handle on the right or on the left? Most people can do that, right? They can kind of mentally conjure up an image of their front door and then they can decide what um, side the door handle is on. But if we really were gonna to wanna to describe, get that precisely, we'd probably ask a whole bunch more questions like, so how far away when you did that, when you pictured your front door, how far away were you? Did you see it like from the street or did you see it from like just before you grab the door handle and so you really just see the space around the door handle? Do you see the trim? All of those kinds of things. And so those are the kind of details we would wanna get if we were getting high fidelity apprehensions of people's inner experience. And then the other thing that we find commonly is feelings. People have feelings. Now that's obviously not a surprise and the feelings are really what drive us in life. What is, there's two things that I want to tell you about this that are surprising. One is, when I asked you, I think I asked early on in this talk, uh, what, how are you feeling right now? Did I say that? So most of the time when you ask people that question, in fact, almost all the time, people will give you an answer. Calm, happy, sad, you know, whatever that answer might be. What we find is that actually when you give people a beep and you go at a precise moment of inner experience, that the, an the correct answer to that question is actually nothing. Because when you give people a beep and you ask them to describe what, everything that's in their experience at a particular moment, about 75% of the time for most people, there is nothing related to a feeling present at all. They're just going about their daily lives and there's no sadness, happiness, anything. Now, it probably is the case, and this is kind of a psychology thing, um, that um, uh, you can search your background. There's probably also always some emotional process that runs in the background. And if you say, well, let me go look for that, you probably can determine some feeling that is a background kind of present. But for most of the people, most of the time, feelings are not actually present in experience as it unfolds. If you take people at their word of what they say when they describe everything that was present at a precisely identified moment of a beep, okay? So inner seeing, inner speaking, feelings, the last two are a little less commonly recognized. One is what we call unsymbolized thinking. So oftentimes people have thoughts about things but they, there's no symbolization of them present. And so, for example, Stacy's example of 20 and 40 years, um, that could be present just as an idea with no words and no pictures. And oftentimes people are surprised because they didn't realize such a thing could happen. You could just have a totally disembodied thought, but that's definitely the case. And the last thing that uh, is often in people's experiences gets to our, a uh, question from Jed here is sensory experience. And sensory, what we call sensory awareness is, is the particular focus on some sensory aspect of the environment. And uh, some people have a lot of sensory awareness when they really just focus on some particular thing, like I can see Renee has a UNLV sign and behind her and I might be focused on just the red and I might be like totally absorbed in the red of that sign and there might be nothing else present in my experience. And 
So to kind of give you a sense of how this works, I'll, I'll tell you a story about a guy who we worked with one time. Um, uh, yeah, and so Jed would have said, seeing your face and tasting my coffee, yes. And so those are both sort of sensory experiences. And if those were your focus, that's a common kind of thing. So one of the, maybe the most important takeaways of our research is that people are often dramatically mistaken when they give broad characterizations of their own inner experience, okay? And so um, we uh, worked with a guy, we did a study on obsessive compulsive disorder. And this is, this is kind of how this gets to be relevant to psychology in a very um, major way, because when we look about at mental health uh, issues, most mental health issues are diagnosed as a function of what people say about their own inner experience, right? So obsessive compulsive disorder can be a very disabil uh, debilitating disorder in which people are troubled by unwanted uh, repetitive thoughts, which are called obsessions, and oftentimes also engage in repeated uh, uh, repetitive behaviors that are called compulsions. And they oftentimes feel like they uh, have to engage in the compulsions. And usually there's a tie between the they want to engage in the compulsions or they feel like they have to engage in those compulsions to control their obsessions. It's really the obsessions that bother people, these unwanted repetitive thoughts. And so we did a study a few years back where we wanted to say, well, let's go get some people who say that they're troubled by these unwanted repetitive thoughts and ask them to wear the, use the beeper and look at their experience one moment at a time. And so we got a young man, and we'll call him Sam, who was actually a student here on campus a number of years ago. And it's, Sam's not his real name. I don't actually even remember what his real name is at this point. But um, he went to see our student counseling service, and they diagnosed him with obsessive compulsive disorder. And they sent him to see us because we were doing this uh, research project in partnership with them. We said, well, you know, we're going to help you try to understand your inner experience just one moment at a time. And he said, well, that's great because I am really bothered by the fact that I am always involved in these unwanted arguments with friends of mine. And so he basically said that he thought almost all of his waking time, he was essentially mentally internally arguing with people in his life about issues about which there were disagreements. And he was just sort of taken by these things all, all the time. And he thought, you know, this is really upsetting to me that I have these constant repeated uh, internal arguments. And uh, so we said, okay, that's fine. We asked you to put that aside for the moment. And we're just only gonna ask you one question. What was present in your experience the moment before the beep sounded, okay? So put aside the general sense you have about these unwanted arguments. And if you find a lot of unwanted arguments, that's totally fine. And if you don't find those, that's totally fine too. We're neutral on all that. We just want to know what's present right at the moment before the beep interrupted you. And he went ahead and um, wore the beeper. And I think we met with him maybe uh, about eight or nine times and got 60 or 70 different moments of his experience. And when we were done on the last day, we said to him, you know what, Sam, we only found one time ever in those 70 moments of experience when you were engaged in anything that sounded like an internal mental argument with somebody. And he said, I can't believe it. I would have said to you that 90% of the time that that beep went off, I would have been involved in those internal mental arguments. And he walked out of our office and I, we haven't kept touch with them, but he walked out of our office a much happier person because he's, you know, you know what? I think I was really wrong about that. It's not present as nearly as often as I think it is. And so it gets into this issue of when people get these general characterizations uh, that they use, there can be real tricks of memory that lead to certain kinds of things being remembered much more often than they were before. And, uh, you know, I think we can all think of examples like that where um, you have some idea or like some, you know, meme or something that you hadn't heard of before, like some expression, and then someone points it out to you, and then all of a sudden you notice it a lot more. It becomes really salient. And so if we have these kind of guiding principles that 
make us pay attention to particular things in this huge uh, stream of consciousness that flies by, we might think, you know what, that's always there. But in reality, it might be there only every once in a while, but we just notice it a lot more. And I'll tell you one more story and then we'll sort of uh, open it up to questions and see if people have thoughts. So we had another guy that we worked with, and actually when I came to UNLV, I was a, a marital therapist, and I did a lot of marital therapy in my early work as a psychologist. And uh, in marital therapy, you know, anger and conflict is a big deal. And so I was working with a, a young couple, and this, uh, the husband and the young couple, they had come to see me because he was having challenges with anger. And he was actually about to get fired from his job because in his interactions at work, he would lose his temper often and start yelling at people. And he had a sort of a high stress job, but he wasn't managing that stress uh, appropriately. And basically they were saying, hey, look, either you gotta figure out how to get that anger under control or you can't, you can't have this job anymore. And so they, they were working with me and because it was also a big problem in their relationship where he would get very angry with his wife and not handle that appropriately. And so I was doing therapy with him um, and trying to help them work through their couple of problems. Uh, and I remember one day when he was in my office and uh, they were having an argument because one of the things that happens in marital therapy is essentially people come to see you and then they have the arguments that they have and they can often get very intense. And I, I said, okay, you know, we got to keep this under control. We got a timeout here. I'm going to ask you to, uh, to Steve or whatever his name was to go in the hall so I can talk to your wife and we're going to kind of sort this out one person at a time because you guys aren't able to have this argument together. And he stood up and he, he walked out of my office and I remember he slammed the door and it was a big heavy fire door to my office so hard that I thought he was going to break the door in half because he was so angry. It just I, I didn't even know it could close that because it had one of those things that try to make it close more slowly. He was so angry. And so I thought, you know, this guy has some things going on with his inner experience that maybe we really should try to help him understand better. And so what I did is I hooked him up with my colleague, Russ, and I said, hey, Russ, would you work with this guy and give him a beeper and try to help him understand his inner experience? Because it seemed like maybe that'll uh, help him get to a place where he gets more of a sense of his anger. And, and Russ said, sure, because we were always interested in trying to understand the inner experience of people who are a little bit different in some way. And so he said he was happy to do that. And so he met with uh, this individual for, I don't know, four or five or six times. And one of the things, that, and this is maybe the most controversial thing that we sometimes uh, say to people is, he came back to me and he said, hey, Chris, Steve doesn't have any inner experience. And so we take for granted that everybody has inner experience and it's probably not the case because inner experience is probably a skill that helps us get a hold of all of the things that are going on in our consciousness and form them into coherent, understandable pieces. But you can imagine a situation in which there's so much going on, or if the person hasn't developed the skill to organize all that, that it's just essentially a sea of kind of random neuron firings that aren't organized into anything. And the, re the way that I think that relates to the challenge that this gentleman is having is the way sort of gets to the theme of why I think inner experience is of value. And this is in the realm of speculation now. And I'll give you a little bit of a metaphor just to tie this all together and then I'll, I'll promise I'll stop and take questions and, and hear comments. Is if you're sailing, one of the things you do, so if you're sailing somewhere, you figure, okay, I wanna get from here to there. Like I you know, went to school in Southern California uh, and I sometimes we would go to Catalina Island, which is 27 miles off the coast. And you can imagine sailing to Catalina Island and you'd say, okay, there's my destination at you know, whatever heading, and there's a wind that's going to push me, and I'm going to go there. But the reality is you're, that's not going to get you to where you want to go unless you also understand what's happening with the current, because the water beneath you is moving you as well. And when you're sailing, you actually can't feel that, right? It's, it happens just because uh, all of the water around you is moving the same way, and so you don't see it, you don't feel it, but if you don't take account of it, you don't end up where you want to be. And so 
inner experience and having an understanding of your inner experience and being in touch with it as a skill is probably valuable because, for example, in the situation that Steve was in, what my colleague Russ said to me is he can't tell when he's getting angry. He doesn't notice it. And so Steve doesn't know he's angry until he's yelling, until he's having huge fights with the people around him. And so because he didn't have that internal sense of what is the current that's going on underneath the surface and how do I adjust for it? Like, you know, we, um, you might be aware of sort of the standard, some of the standard techniques, you know, count to 10. But if you don't know you're getting angry, you can't figure out when to count to 10. You just start yelling and sometimes even worse. And so inner experience probably is a skill and it's probably a skill that's valuable to help you and all of us understand the underlying currents of our experience so that we can adjust um, our behavior uh, according to kind of what our internal state is. And so that what comes out of our mouth and what comes out of us in terms of behavior is actually modulated to the situation and not overly distorted by what's happening inside of us. And, you know, we could talk about a lot of different examples of this, of people who are quick to conflict or, you know, always think someone's out to get them or other things. And those are probably things that are undercurrents in their own inner experience that they're not actually compensating for in how they're uh, interacting with the world. Uh, and that's a, but you know, that does kind of go over into the realm a little bit of speculation. Um, uh, but I think that's probably pretty safe to say that it's valuable to be able to have a clear sense of what your inner experience is so that you can function more effectively as you go out. Um, Go about life, and so let me stop there for a moment and see. Uh, um, uh, it's here, so I can just read these in the. If chat. you like, I can I can unmute them if you want to have a conversation. Uh, sure. So we can just uh, take them. Um, so take them however you want. Sure. We'll we'll go in order. So Stephen uh, was the first question, so I'll go ahead and unmute him. Hi, Stephen, if you want to go ahead and ask, and ask your question. Hi, uh, Dr. Heavey. Uh, this is just a fascinating area that you're getting into. And and my question is, is uh, has it ever been considered by researchers in this area that some people are more aware of their inner experience than other people are? Because there may be objective ways to assess that. and. If you did, then the researchers could seek out those who are most aware of their inner experience to learn more about it. So, yes, Stephen, I think you're totally correct that some people that it's and I think it's a full continuum that some people are very skillful at uh, understanding and capturing their inner experience and some people can't do it at all. And so we have definitely. Um, had uh, experiences of working with people for long periods of time and feeling like they could actually never give a clear answer to the question, what was present to you right at the moment the beep sounded? And what's most surprising about that is they don't know it. They think they're answering that question. So I, I remember working with one young woman who uh, was saying, so we, she said, I'm walking out to my car and I'm, I'm, uh, you know, about to get in and I said, okay, what's present to you? And she says, well, when I go out to my car, I always, you know, unlock it with the remote control. And okay, and we say, okay, yeah, that's what you generally do, but what was present to you right at that moment? She says, well, you know, I don't know, it's a great car and, you know, and there's never, and, and this, is, you know, in any one example, it's, it's understandable that a lot of moments escape people, but for her, it was every moment. There never was a clear answer to that question. And so I do think it's a full continuum. Other people can do it really well the first day and uh, report very easily on it. Um, and I also think people vary in this uh, complexity. So some people have very simple inner experience. I think when I've done it, I am a big inner speaker. I speak to myself a lot. And that inner speaking is pretty easy. You can just, it's you know linear and you just um, uh, 
kind of grab, I'm, I was saying this, I was right at this word. Other people are much more visual. And I also think, so there's kind of individual differences. So one of the most creative and insightful people I know, I had the do, chance to do some sampling with that individual. And that person was super visual, nothing but complex, rich images. And you can think about it, images are more, they convey more information. I'm a pretty linear, you know, I consider myself a pretty boring guy and, you know, pretty good at like keeping things in a row and that kind of stuff. But uh, if you want to be creative, you probably being visual is probably a more um, uh, complex space in which to operate from a creativity perspective. So I do, do think that they vary on all of the dimensions that you're talking about. All right, we'll go ahead and go on to the next question. Jed, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you if you want to ask your question. Jed, you're on. I don't think I can unmute. Yeah. Oh, we can hear you. You're okay. good. Um, so I'll just read you the question that I, that I typed in there. I'm curious how the idea of, of inner experience relates to the ego is um, is our sense of an inner experience kind of developed by our ego or is it the other way around does our ego sort of build from the collection of inner experiences well that's a good question and and i i like the concept of ego and i think it's a very useful kind of um psychological idea, but I would say it is a conceptual thing. Um, and when we're looking at inner experience, we are looking at uh, things that I would call much more objective, that they uh, do exist at particular moments in time. And so I think that, you know, when I think about the concept of ego, it's a kind of organizing principle for uh, people's ability to psychologically organize and restrain impulses. Uh, and I do think that there's something to that, you know, and that people, ego strength, some people have better, you know, more well-developed egos that re are reflected in impulse control and things like that. But um, I don't think it overlays directly on the concept of inner experience. And so I think, um, Yeah, so I guess I would say I think they're a little bit orthogonal ideas. It may well be that the in the concept that ego would be, you know, if we were going to think about it in concrete terms, would be the kind of organizing principle that generates the inner experience. Because I do think that from the conception of inner experience being a skill, it does take some some mental structures or energies to help organize those things into something that's coherent. So I think, yeah, I think I would probably would say that to the extent that we buy into that concept, it would be a reasonable kind of conceptual representation of what's needed to organize inner experience. All right, we'll go ahead and go on to the next question. Uh, Diane, I'll go ahead and unmute you if you want to ask your question. Hi, great. Thanks, Renee. Uh, as you were discussing this, I was thinking about Daniel Goleman's emotional intelligence. Have you done any uh, comparison or how do you relate the inner experience with emotional intelligence? Yes, I do speculate that there is a connection between um, people's, the coherence of people's inner experience and their emotional intelligence. And I think it goes back to that kind of sailing metaphor that if we don't have a good sense of where we are at a moment, it's pretty hard to keep aligned with other people. And excuse me, that's the way I think about inner uh, emotional intelligence is the ability to really um, uh, be very in sync with someone else in terms of reading them. But if you're on an unshaky, you know, a shaky foundation, unstable foundation, um, then I think that's harder. And I would say our, our informal observations are the people that we've sampled with who struggle with the process seem to be people who uh, have, you know, broadly speaking, um, deficits that are in the realm of, you know, broad strokes of mental health slash emotional intelligence. Okay, great, thank you. 
and we have Tony Terrell, who's our speaker for next month. Um, Tony, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. Great, thank you, Renee. Uh, thank you, uh, Provost Lee, for your time. Uh, you already hit on some of uh, the things already. I had a question about, but just any tools that you can share to, to help us cultivate this a little bit better. Yeah, thanks for that question, Tony, and good to hear your voice. I look uh, forward to your presentation. Um, I think um, you know we have approached this from a very basic science point of view of just trying to understand the landscape of inner experience, and so we haven't really. Um, approach it from a point of view of intervention, but I do think um, that it lines up well with mindfulness practices, which are um, uh, very um, you know popular these days. That essentially are kind of non-judgmental observation of the ongoing experience that passes by, and so. Um, I think practices of either meditation or mindfulness that are focused on just saying, let me just try to observe what is present uh, is a, a process of building skill. And we actually think that uh, the, the beeping sampling work that we do with people sort of leads to the same thing, that they generally really like it. So one of the things is it's a fairly time intensive process to work with us and almost nobody quits. And in fact, it's more often that people ask us if they can go longer in the research project than we wanna go because you know we generally do you know six or eight weeks of work with somebody. And oftentimes they'll say, well, you know, I'm happy to go keep going because they find the experience um, in some way organically healthy. And I do think in that way, it's kind of um, similar to maybe uh, mindfulness or meditation practices. And you could all uh, always um, uh, find some kind of, you know, random beeper of your own and just, or some kind of cue that would say just like, okay, when that cue goes off, I'm just going to like center myself and say, what's present to me now? What, what am I thinking? What am I feeling? How am I having that experience? And I think in general um, that, any kind of effort in that direction ends up being helpful. And it's consistent with the evidence that mindfulness and meditation are both, you know, really good for people's mental health. We have another question from Steven. So I'm going to go ahead and unmute Steven. Hi. Um, yeah, you talked earlier about repetitive thoughts. And of course, everybody experiences that from time to time. But for me, it's pretty much under control, but what I do have a problem with is annoying music that plays over and over again in my head. And I was wondering if, if you ever had clients who have expressed that as being a problem and, and have any idea what might cause cause it, whatever you want to call it, repetitive music or whatever. Yeah, so the first thing I would say is, well, they, um, we don't do anything, none of our research gets into the issue of cause. Um, we don't know anything about um, what the kind of underlying processes are that give rise to these things. Um, so again, we're in the business of trying to describe the landscape of inner experience in a careful way. And what I would say is uh, first start with the notion of making that an open question um, and making sure that you try to non, uh, you know, without judgmentally, non-judgmentally observe whether or not that is in fact the case. <clears throat> and because of this issue of um, the salience can lead to, we've definitely a lot of experience of dramatic differences in the perceived frequency of particular types of inner experience among people and what we find when we do random sampling. And so I would encourage you to kind of take that approach of saying, well, let me go back and look and see whether or not that's really the case. And if you do, in fact, find this case, because, you know, obviously, I don't know whether it is or not, I would say just the non judgmental stance of observation of inner experience is probably the best one to take from a mental health point of view, because you don't want to create cycles in which um, you uh, compound frustration by being frustrated about the experience. And so to the extent that you can uh, let whatever those experiences are wash over you without um, judgment, I think that's the, the best way to go. And uh, 
you know, ideally uh, they would fade away over time. Um, and uh, I think that, yeah, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. And a random beeper might be an interesting thing to try just to see how often you find it present when you, um, you do it. Um, and I can see Stacy's question here. Uh, um, yeah. Um, so th the first part about that is is selective attention, and selective attention is a really powerful um, tool of human beings to um, focus attention, and it does clear. It is clearly the case that uh, we can perform many activities without any actual consciousness of them. And so my classic example, you know, and I don't know if you have this one too, Stacy, is, uh, is washing my hair, which I, I have less and less of these days, so it's become less of a problem. But, you know, I remember being in the shower many days and thinking, wait, did I just wash my hair or not? Because I was so engaged in what I was thinking about. Um, and so it shows that we can really narrow our attention down to um, uh, something, and that something can be totally internal, totally like oblivious to the external world. And we can drive, and you know, we we find that with a lot of our samples, you know, we have had samples of people driving, and often they're not paying any attention to the driving; they're lost in thought, but they're driving okay. You know, they're not crashing into things. Um, <clears throat> And we often uh, do also um, find we've done a lot of uh, sampling with students in lectures and they're often it's funny, you know, so if you uh, spaced out at any point during this lecture, don't feel bad because it's super common for people to being sitting in a lecture saying, well, I was sitting in a lecture, but I really have no idea what the person was talking about or often often actually in a one on one conversation. That's true, too, is that people are in direct conversation with somebody and the beep goes off and they have to you know, they come in and they sheepishly admit that they were not paying at all attention to what the person was saying. They were thinking about what they were going to have for dinner or, you know, whatever else that happened to grab their attention at that moment. So it's a very flighty. Attention is very flighty. That happens to me in church. I am praying and I'm listening to the pastor and then all of a sudden, what am I going to eat after church? What am I going to do? After? So that's so true. Yes. It's, it's not just you, so you can feel good about that. <laughs> but I do enjoy church. But I, I have one more question in my in my chat that I do a lot of self-talking. So when you said that, the first thing that you said out of the five self, you know, or, uh, is really I envision my, I try to mitigate my fear. I'm not afraid of it anymore, but I was a lector in church. And I would walk up there and I would, as I'm walking up the steps, I'm telling myself, you got this, you memorized everything. Don't look down, look up, speak slowly. I'm telling this, I'm talking to myself over and over again, even though I've been reading for 20 years at St. Elizabeth Ann Seat in my church, I keep saying the same, telling myself, don't worry about this. You got, don't be scared. Cause otherwise, if I don't do that ritual or something, then I become distressed or something, just like I become scared, but I know what I'm going to say. I've rehearsed it. Yeah. Yeah. And those are clearly effective techniques. You know, I think we would psychologists would put that in the uh, camp of self regulation, the strategies that we, you know, intentionally use to try to put ourselves in the right uh, mind frame to do it. And, and it's definitely a tried and true method and uh, I think good, good strategy. All right, we have one more question that was in the chat. So I'm going to go ahead and unmute Rebecca. Can you hear Rebecca, me? Rebecca, if you want to go ahead and ask your question. Can yeah. you hear me? Yeah. Oh, good. Go okay, perfect. Hi, Chris. Thanks so much. This is super, super interesting and, and an area that I didn't have any knowledge even existed. So I'm really fascinated. Um, I'm thinking about two questions. And the first is, I, I'm the person who's doing some research with Alicia Brown out at the VA with uh, uh, combat veterans with post-traumatic stress disorder. And we have an immersion intervention and looking at some uh, physiological measures and also a um, qualitative, some open-ended questions after the intervention. And so my first question is, I. I'm fascinated. I didn't even know that there were people who couldn't 
who didn't have the skill and had no idea about what was going on, on with them. So that's a whole nother issue. But can you compress this beeper kind of data collection into a small, into a more compressed period of time, like maybe before, during, and immediately after, say an hour intervention or something? Can you compress it? Yes, we can. Um, and yeah, we've done some work like that. Um, it gets tricky because one of the things about this, um, and this is kind of a broader conversation, is that because the experience is private, uh, it's important to set up conditions in which um, there's no other influences on what the person reports other than them just wanting to tell you what is actually in their experience. Um, and so as soon as you put it in an experimental situation where you kind of have some manipulation in between, um, it, it's a little bit of a different environment. And so the way that we would probably suggest doing that, just thinking out loud is train people first to be observers in a, just a pure way without any intervention and then do it because then they'll at least have built up the skill. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay, that, that's super interesting. And it sounded from your last comment that you guys are just purely at this point at a, in your understanding of all of this, maybe at a descriptive level, because you said you didn't really know about the cause. And so one of the questions I had written, is this something people don't learn as children or is there some kind of physiological problem with the plasticity of the, you know something like that but it sounds like you're not at that point yeah that's correct so and and we've also you know again wanted to make sure we keep a completely non-judgmental stance um and probably in some of our papers we've written about the notion of it's probably best to have people who are trying to uh, to get the clear view of the phenomena and let other people theorize about it mm -hmm. to keep kind of a clear a boundary between those to not contaminate uh, our examination, which is just trying to get these high fidelity understandings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. This has really been fascinating. I'm really uh, appreciative that I had this opportunity. Thanks. Thank, thank you, you for being here. Okay, Renee, it looks like we've used our time for today. Yes, thank you so much. I, I, I love this type of work. I love this type of conversation. So thank you for presenting for Rebel Recharge and I will pass it on to Stacey and Blake to give their thanks. But again, thank you for taking the time out today. Dr. Heavey, you, the time we spent together is just not enough. It, it's so thought provoking and interesting and I want to invite you to come back for part two and part three, if you don't mind. I've been waiting for this since I was up there announcing that you were the next speaker in person. Do you remember that? You were at the table right in front of me. And so it seems like years ago and it was one year ago. So it's been a year, but thank you for your tremendous time of just letting people ask questions and just getting into your your inner, you know, that that it's really special because it's only us. And so you really don't think about things like that. But I think there's more to it. And I'd love to hear more and enjoy your time on the mountain trails in Henderson. I am sure lots of inner thinking goes on when you're just alone and with yourself in, in that environment and, you know, with nature and the wind and the rain and whatever. Um, I'll see you soon. And I just want to say thank you, Blake, on to you. Absolutely. Thank you, Stacey. And, and thank you, uh, Dr. Heavey, for those uh, amazing uh, thoughts and insights into, into this idea and concept. Uh, it's certainly a fascinating way to spend a Friday afternoon and definitely worth a year wait. I can definitely say that without a doubt. So I know you're busy and I, we uh, definitely appreciate your time being with us today and um, have a great weekend. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Take care. Thank you. And one more thing, Tondra D, you rock girl. I saw you on there. Hi, Tondra. Good. Thanks, everyone. Have a wonderful weekend and thank you for joining in.